Today we'll see a story of how God spoke and then broke the bondage of fury, imprisoning one man's heart. My life had come very close to death, giving me more credibility, I felt, giving me a story to tell, because every gangster wants a story to tell. But Jack's story almost ended early when, as an impressionable teenager, he dared to enter the dangerous world of street gangs. And I remember being at this party, and I heard whispers, they're here, they're here, they're here. And I remember, as I was at this party, seeing these bloods walk in. There's nothing but crips. And they're facing each other, and here, behold, is this leader that I've been hearing about. And I mean, it was like looking at a god. And suddenly, like the reputation about him, I see him pulling out this gun, and he just starts shooting. And it was there, I was like, whoa, this is cool. This is power. Power is an intoxicating force, as is the feeling of belonging. The false promise of gangs is that they can provide both. I want to be the most real, respected, revered gangster that I could be. And for me, it meant doing whatever, 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 whatever. Jack, he was on the road of destruction. I saw his life going to nowhere, no man's land. Jack turned to making a quick dollar by selling narcotics. As his desire for money, power, and respect grew, so did his willingness to take risk. He had a plan. He was going to rob his drug connection, a crip. Sometimes we do these cross business deals where blood would deal with a crip, only for money, you know? And, and I dealt with him a couple times, you know? And we, we met somewhere at some burger joint, and basically I held him up with a little 22 and, and took his drugs, and, but I didn't realize that a girl that I knew had told him where I lived. So that same night, me and my friend, we came home, we were celebrating, we called all the friends over. To Jack's surprise, his party was interrupted by the sound of his car alarm screaming in the distance. I go out to my car and I beep beep, you know, chirp my car and I turn around and there's a guy with a 357 pointed to my head. He's shaking, he's crying. He's like, why'd you have to do it? Why'd you have to, you know, rob me? And I'm looking at the barrel of a gun as this guy is about to kill me. I felt like Clint Eastwood in a Western movie. I turn to him and say, and I look him in the eye and say, kill me. And that's what he tries to do. Boom! I mean, this gun goes off, and I hit the ground. Am I dead? Am I alive? I guess the gun was so powerful that it cocked on him, and he missed me. It was these events that I believe gave me even more of a rite of passage, more credibility, but also was making me question the existence of my life. Why was I here? What was my purpose? Having served time in juvenile hall for violent crime and drug offenses, Jack was never far from falling back into prison. In fact, it took only a routine traffic stop to land him in a courthouse. The next thing I know, the, the judge is opening up my case files says, you're on probation for two previous drug cases. Boom, six months LA County Jail, which is probably the worst jail in the United States of America. It's literally like hell. Imagine like uh, six, by six cells and just the stench, concrete floors, gray, cold, kind of institutional feel. And all you see is hands and faces and thick hands. You could tell like these are men, penitentiary men. People were fighting double lives, murders. I had to confront my life, confront God. It was there that I cried out to. Right now I need a miracle. And for me, I need to get out this hell. Coming up next, we'll witness the power of redemption. There's beauty in this scarred face of mine, in this scarred life, in this scarred past. God's grace is in it. I want to be the most real, respected, revered gangster that I could be. And for me, it meant doing whatever. The next thing you know, boom, six months, LA County Jail, literally like hell. Someone gave me a Bible, a pastor gave me this Bible, and I started reading the stories of Jesus and the way he loved sinners. And I started reading the Psalms and the Proverbs of Solomon. If you do this, this will happen. Oh yeah, that made sense, cause and effect. Oh, okay, God is very logical. 
Jesus was a friend of sinners, prostitutes, the outcasts of society, and he said, I've come to save these kind of people, which I identified with. And it was there that I had a spiritual experience that was life transforming and began the slow process of changing not only my perspective of God, but of human beings. And I could say one word, love. Love transformed me. I'd never felt this before, this love, the sense of spiritual belonging to a higher power, to this person named God. It's sad to say, but when I saw that transition coming, I didn't even believe it. He was in jail and he would call me collect and he would say, this happened, you know, I prayed to God, and he answered my prayer. Oh, okay, good. Oh, I prayed again, God answered my prayer. I've been reading the Bible in jail. Well, I got out of jail, and I started going to church, and I started, I, for me, I didn't pull away from my friends. They were my friends. I'm willing to die for them. I was at the neighborhood house. We had some conflicts with some Sudanians. And I remember one of the older leaders who originally was the guy I was talking about, who was this icon that everyone revered, was telling the young ones, here's some guns, he was giving them guns, this is what you guys needed to do. Next time they roll up, you just start capping on them, which is start shooting them. And I remember jumping up, feeling the zeal on my heart, saying, hey, don't, don't tell them to kill. Number one, they can go to jail, and you're not gonna go visit them. You guys never visit you know, anyone else. And number two, they can go to hell by doing that. And I remember him just looking at me baffled. Like, what, what is wrong with you? What happened to you? And he walked in the other room, and I knew what he was gonna do. He could try to prove a point. He walked into the room, got a sawed off 12 gauge, and came back. You want me to show you God? I'll show you God. He took that 12 gauge and pointed at me. With the whole time he was in the room, I was thinking about running. My knees started to shake, because he's a shooter. He will shoot. I've seen him do it, just to make a point. He understands the psyche of human beings, to use people to make a point. But I knew the power of love I experienced it in jail, where I disarmed people by just having love for them and saying, I love them. I turned to him, I said, look, man, I love you. I love these baby gangsters. I'm not doing it, you know, to undermine you, man. And I remember him just looking at me, like frustrated, and just putting his gun down, saying, man, just get out of here. I knew that forever I had parted. That day, I had to look for new friends, complete new identity. I was no longer this new Christian in the hood. I was a new Christian who had been rejected. As Jack's transformation became more visible, people started seeking his spiritual advice. God had a plan to use Jack for his purpose. When a former friend and gang member was murdered, his family asked Jack to speak at the funeral. I was walking around just telling him, man, Jesus loves you, giving him hugs. And my friend, who was the one who was basically the key leader, looked at me in the eye and he was twitching. I knew he wanted to hit me, but he, out of respect, he was controlling himself, but he was looking at me and saying, man, don't, don't say anything about Jesus here. I said, why? I was like, man, you, you know, God loves you. And, and, I, and I probably pushed it in my zeal, my passion for him and for Christianity. And all I knew was I saw a hand coming and hit me in the head. And I just wrapped my arms around him. I said, I'm not going to fight you. And he kept hitting me, he kept hitting me. And it was amazing because throughout the whole time I, as he was hitting me and people were trying to break us apart, I kept telling him, man, Jesus loves you. And it was there that I really experienced what the Bible talks about is the power of God in the midst of physical persecution. And I remember like him looking at me and all these gangsters, you know, maybe up 50 to 100 gangsters and them just throwing up their signs, this is pyro blood, da da da. I remember looking at them all and say, man, Jesus Christ, man, he loves you all. A few years later, the same gentleman, who in the beginning of my journey was this icon, this God, saw me again and came up to me and hugged me and said, man, he apologizes for the way he treated me. And last I heard was he was considering becoming religious. Sometimes I, I, I think of Jack and I say, man, he read the Bible too much. I mean, come on, how much can you read the Bible? How much can you quote from the Bible? You ask Jack a verse, he'll take you to the page. I used to think that was ridiculous. Until you sit down and read the Bible, and then you see there's some good stuff in here. In the end, there's grace. 
when you understand that, I think you come to a place where you can enjoy this fallen, broken world. And you can look at a wall that's marred and dirty or spray painted neighborhood and say, you know what? There's beauty in these ashes. There's beauty in this scarred face of mine, in this scarred life, in this scarred past. God's grace is in it. The Bible says in Romans 5, where sin abounds, God's grace abounds much more. In 2005, the American Bible Society gave away at no cost scriptures worth $1,399,756 in the United States.